Thank you. I'm part Welsh and I've never been to Wales, so I'm excited. Excellent. Excellent. Now, you were born in a very small town, very rural community. It wasn't rural, actually. It was the Canadian Arctic. So there was uh, frozen tundra and miles and miles of frozen snow. And I was born, actually, in a Red Cross shack off a mine shaft and delivered by an Eskimo woman. Um, and why I'm so sophisticated today, and suave. <laughs> and um, then we moved around northern Canada to mining town. So there were no there, was, there were no houses actually. The miners lived in tents. A lot of the Aboriginal people still lived the old way, Canadian Indians. And um, and then we moved on to other tiny towns and or mine, mining camps really. Yeah. And um, Wales is famous for mining. Coal it mining. Is. Yeah, coal mining. How does one get from that to LA? I think if you're brought up, how many of you are from small towns? You spend half your life thinking when you're young how to get out. And I had not seen movies until I was nine, and the priest in a small town in northern Quebec showed them in a bunkhouse, actually. Or no, it was off the off the off a, a room off the church where us kids got to see them. I saw my first movie and went, I'm gonna do that when I grow up. And so I had no other purpose in life. That was my focus from the time I was little. And when we ended up in Vancouver, when I was the last two years of high school, I, what do you call high school here? High school. Oh, high school. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, uh, I just, I knew at that point I was gonna be an actress and tried out for the CBC, which is like the British BBC, and just kept on going. Never stopped. So it was imagination, reading a lot of books. We didn't have television, barely had radio. So you lived in books and imagination, and basically it was a good combo. Fantastic. And your first job was TV? First job was TV. I played a lot of troubled teenagers, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess I was, but um, I, I didn't think so. I just thought I was, I don't know what I thought. <laughs> Yeah, I played a lot of troubled teenagers, and then I ended up in Toronto. In fact, I remember I was at university at 16, which is young in the States to be at the university because we skipped uh, a couple of grades. And, and then I went, oh gosh, I've got to quit. I'll be 19 by the time I get my degree. I'll be old. That's terrible. So I quit university and got on a train to go to Toronto to find my fortune as an actress. And a lot of girlfriends had giving me a big pack of food because I couldn't afford a berth to sleep and I couldn't afford to go to the dining car. So I sat there and I had two books with me. I had War and Peace and Anna Karenina. And I ate half the food and something that I thought was a candy bar. But in fact, it was a box of x lax Do you have x lax here? <laughs> it's a laxative. And I ate the whole thing down and spent the rest of the trip in the bathroom watching Canada go by with, from this slot in the window, reading uh, War and Peace and Anna Karenina. So by the time I arrived in Toronto, I was 10 pounds thinner and in love with Russian literature. <laughs> that was, and then I decided to make my mark. Uh, you probably made your mark on that train. Uh, uh, bad, that was really a bad joke. <laughs> so from there, we skip to 1974. And without a doubt, the first proper slasher as we know them, Black Christmas. Oh, but we made that in 72 or 73. Wow. It came out in 74. I was a scream queen, what is what we call them before. Oh, the first Superman. scream queen. Well, I'd done Sisters yeah. before before Black Christmas or after, I can't remember. I think it might have come out after. But we might have done it. We may, yeah, we might have filmed it before. And I think, I can't remember, there was a whole slew of them, something called The Reincarnation of Peter Proud. Um, I did, I was a good screamer, so I did a lot of those kinds of movies. Uh, and, and, and Superman came later, so I was sort of known as a scream queen. Well, touching on Superman, um, obviously a lot of people tried out for that role. They did. A lot of people tried out for that role. Next to Princess Leia, the most wanted role for young girls in Hollywood. I guess, yeah. Tell talk us through your audition. Talk about the audition? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was living on a ranch in Montana. I'm back in Montana now. Um, in a very bad marriage. And uh, 
knew I had to get out of it and knew the best way to get my self-esteem back and get strength was to get a part. Called an agent in LA and said, I need some work quickly. <laughs> Flew down to LA and auditioned for Superman. I, did, I grew up without Superman comics, without Superman on TV, having no idea that this was an iconic character, Lois Lane. Um, my mother didn't let us read comics. She thought it was trash, so we had to read good books. So we weren't allowed comics in the house. Um, so I went down and I just took the part from the pages of the script they'd given me and thought, oh, this is supposed to be funny. And I like making people laugh. So I tried to make it as funny as I could. And then they said, would you be willing to screen test in England in a week? And I went, you bet. And uh, got back to the ranch of Montana and flew to England and got the part and got divorced. <laughs> so I flew there actually going, I have to get this part. It's the only way I'll be able to have the strength to either stay in or get out of my marriage. But at the time, it was such a bad marriage. Um, uh, so I needed, I, my ego needed the part. I, it sounds so tacky to put it that way, but I was really desperate. So I knew the thing to do was to look as if I loved the guy playing Superman, whoever he was. And I got there, and here was this skinny, dorky guy whose pants were too high for his legs with big, humongous Oxfords on. And I thought, this is Superman? Oh, my Lord, okay, well, I have to look as if I love him because that's the only way I'm going to get the part. So I looked adoringly at him and got the part, and that was that. <laughs> but, uh, um, what could only be described as a somewhat busy two years followed yeah. the film. It was actually wonderful. The director, Richard Donner, who I called Harry, so if I call someone Harry in this talk, it's Dick Donner, he could never remember anyone's name. So he'd look at Chris and go, uh, Brad, Michael, <laughs> Dave, uh, uh, and he finally get Chris. And with me, I was Barbara, I was Susan, I was everything, and I went, fine, Harry. So it stuck for me. My daughter still, for years, didn't know he was actually Dick. Okay. Um, uh, and he had a great gift for making you feel safe and making you feel loved and for creating a family around him. And I know it's cliche to say that working on movies like having a new family, but on Superman we really did. And we were in England where we didn't live for a year and a half on the first one. We were a year over schedule, which is a lot. Um, and, and Chris became my younger brother, and I pushed him around, as you do with younger brothers. And we got very close in that respect. And Donna was dad, and uh, Gene was Uncle Gene. You know, there was a whole, not literally, but there was a whole metaphor for family that was created. It was a joy, really a joy, except for the flying, which really hurt. Now, <laughs> Chris famously stayed in character. During the many hours <laughs> he did. In, the, in the harness. <laughs> he stayed in character all the time. And one time, actually, one of the ways we flew was in body molds. They created, you'd stand there in underwear, and they'd throw plaster all over you and wait till it hardened. And then they would make a very, very thin, thin fiberglass mold of your body, which got stuck on the end of a an arm sticking about 40 feet out from the ceiling in Pinewood in England. Um, and then you'd climb in and they'd put your costume over top. And there was an electromagnetic ball operated by a guy on the far side of the soundstage who would make you go for days, <laughs> weeks. It was very dull. Um, and one time, somebody dropped the clapperboard. You know when you see movies and it goes, scene 32, take one. <laughs> That thing on the wire that connected us to the machine that made us go yin, 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 yin. Um, and it cut off the electrical current and literally the body mold, we're 40 feet up in the air, flipped right upside down. It was terrifying. We did have seatbelt things on. And Chris, in character as usual, <laughs> reached out to my body as we flipped upside down. And I went, what are you doing? And he said, well, I thought I could hold us up. That's how much he cared. <laughs> it was, I went, oh. <laughs> Obviously, Dick was replaced. 
on yes. the uh, on the on the, the shooting of the film, and you were quite outspoken about that. I was. I called the producers beneath contempt as human beings, and they didn't like that, so they cut me out of Superman Three. I had twelve lines, and one was Oak Clark. That was <laughs> how infuriated they were by that. They cut him out because they didn't want to pay him the money they would have owed him for Superman II because he had a piece of the profits. And they were absolutely crooked, the producers, the Salkins, um, and were wanted in seven different countries. They had passports for seven countries, so if you sued them, as Dick Lester had, they would dissolve the company and be worth a pound or a peso or a dollar or whatever, depending on what country it was in, and you wouldn't get your money. Um, so they fired Dick Donner, even though we'd shot most of Superman II, uh, and hired Richard Lester, who they owed $6 million to for The Three Musketeers, and said, we'll pay you plus an extra million if you finish Superman II. So Donner was shattered and poured his heart and soul into that movie. Um, and we went to do Superman II, and the Directors Guild of America said, no, Mr. Lester, you can't get a credit on this, or he called the director, because you're only shooting two scenes. So they rewrote half the movie, badly, I felt, and reshot it so that Lester could get a credit and they didn't have to pay Dick Donner. Cut to years later, people like you all wrote in and called Warner Brothers going, where's the real Superman to? And Richard got to go in the studio and recut it. How many of you have seen Superman to the Richard Donner cut? Oh, so you all know this story. Don't you think it's better? I think it's so much better than the one that was released to Superman 2. That it's sort of wonderful that it got re-released and heartbreaking all at the same time. That it wasn't released on the day. It's it's quite good from our aspects as fans. Because right. now with the proliferation of the internet, we find out about the Donner Cup. And we find out Richard's side of the story. Yeah, and you've all heard my stories before, so I might as well just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's <coughs> great that we hear your side, I yeah. remember, uh, oh, right. other than the, the party line. The official, yeah, side. the official side. I was never big on the official no. side of anything. No. Well, <laughs> leading us on to... It must be the Welsh in me. <laughs> <laughs> leading us on to your political and, uh -huh. you know, and activist beliefs, which we were okay. just discussing down, downstairs. Um, do you want to explain a little bit about your political side? And well, the, the in most countries, do? except for Great Britain and America, it's assumed that people in the arts will be politically, have lost two already, but they're not, uh-oh, politics, we're leaving. Oh, we gained three then. Oh. <laughs> so one. Okay. Um, uh, it's assumed that if you really are examining yourself and your world around you, which artists are meant to do. You're also looking at the political aspect of things. I believe deeply that the personal is the political and vice versa. That if you hold certain beliefs, for example, if you have gay friends who you love, then you're for equality for gay people. It just stands to reason. And if you're in a country where it doesn't exist, then you try and work towards making it exist. I don't think there's a big separation there. I don't think it's about political parties. I think it's about standing up for what you believe in. And um, because I believe that we've trashed our environment horribly, and probably you have some parts of Wales that are sadly really trashed from coal mines, um, which contribute to climate change, then I believe you work towards cleaning up your environment. I got arrested in front of the White House uh, with four other Montana women and a, a, a Canadian Aboriginal woman who's Cree, Tantu Cardinal. She was the wife in Dances with Wolves, the older woman. Um, she was chanting, chanting Cree war songs as we got arrested, which really baffled the Washington, D.C. police. We got arrested for protesting a pipeline that would expand what in the states are tar sands, they're getting oil out of the ground and it's the biggest contributor to climate change on the planet with the exception of coal mines in Australia. So I think, uh, I feel strongly that we have to clean up our environment and leave the world a better place for my grandchildren. So I believe it's then my responsibility to take action 
to do that, to crush our politicians, who are usually the last to figure anything out. We, the people, have to lead them. Um, to, so that's why I got arrested for that. I'm now working to organize our county in Montana for someone named Bernie Sanders. Have you heard of him over here? You have? He's great. So um, I brought Bernie buttons with me. <laughs> I don't have Bernie buttons. Um, so I guess I'm an old lefty. Uh, Wales is famous for being labor. I checked you out before I came. <laughs> um, I, so that too might be the Welsh in me. I don't know. Grew up in mining camps and turned into a lefty. That sounds pretty Welsh to me, doesn't it? Yeah. So I guess the Welsh is really ferocious. Welsh is strong. Yeah. So I spend most of my time doing political work and standing up for stuff I believe in. Yeah. Can we open it to the floor? Please. So the questions. Uh, if you've got a question, can you put your hands up and my man Steve will uh, supply the microphone. There we go. Um, what a pleasure to see you here. Thank you. Um, one, of, uh, one of my favourite uh, films is Black Christmas. Ah, Christmas. that's another one of the horror films uh, I forgot. Well, do you consider it to be uh, more of a psychological thriller or more of a precursor to the, the slash films like Halloween that came out? Well, the is problem with that, I think it's a psychological thriller. When I did Halloween and they took it away from Rob Zombie and cut it, they just cut from slash to slash to slash. If you don't, in a horror movie or a thriller, have the build up to the violence or the person being killed, it's not as scary and it's not as much fun to watch for me. Maybe you feel differently and you just like lots of blood. But I think the real key to those movies is to build the tension slowly and therefore they have to be psychological thrillers because you have to figure out what's going to scare the audience watching it. And usually what scares you will scare the audience. We're all in this species pretty much made right, of the same stuff, kind of psychologically all not all that different. So I think the early ones I did, like Sisters, like Black Christmas, Reincarnation of Peter Proud, even Amityville Horror, are probably now considered psychological thrillers. In those days, they were just thrillers. They were horror movies. That's what you did in a horror movie. For example, Sisters, which is, has anyone here seen Sisters? One person. It, I played French-Canadian Siamese twins, a first in cinema history, I believe. <laughs> and uh, there was a build-up in that one because Brian De Palma, who directed it, was a great Alfred Hitchcock fan. And so he emulated a lot of his filmic trick, tricks. And it became, um, and Hitchcock was a master at scaring people. So I, I, the question's interesting. I believe that's what thriller should be like. Yeah. Next question. You look so much like David Beckham, I can't take my eyes off you, this answer guy right here. I mean, really, you're gorgeous. I'm older, I'm allowed to say that, I'm a grandmother. <laughs> what about you thought of um, Off the Grid Living, the Earth ships in America? Beg your pardon? Off the Grid Living, the Earth ships? Oh, I don't know what Earth ships are, but Off the Grid Living, we're trying to make in our little town what we call sustainable town, so that we create our own energy, We, but we're just starting. <laughs> um, there is a lot of... Uh, or there are a lot of attempts being made now at off the grid living. It's not a mass movement. Is it here? That's fabulous. It's great. I. It's a what? Oh, it's you. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear where your voice was coming. Sorry. We've got an earthship in Brighton. Oh. That's the only one I think we've got in the UK. But in the USA, it's really, really big. Ah. Research. It's fascinating. How it's wonderful. Tires and pots and pans to build these houses. That sounds great. Yeah. Do you know what I believe? Maybe the rest of you don't. I think we're approaching a time in human history when stuff that was science fiction is coming true. And I think if we don't very quickly figure out how to do off the grid living, we're toast as a species. And I was never interested in science fiction when I was young, but now that the world, I'm older, so it all seems weird to me what's going on on the planet. 
and ch climate change is huge and will destroy the human species if we don't very quickly make big changes. Um, it reads to me, the newspapers read like science fiction. They really do. The science fiction of my youth is now real. Um, and yeah, I'm a huge supporter of off the grid living. Huge, huge, huge. And think we better do it quickly in, in community after community after community. Luckily, I live in a town small enough where we really are trying to get our whole town off the grid. Now, we have some old crotchety, what we call in the state, climate deniers, people who don't think there is climate change, uh, which is weird to me, um, who are going, man, we just need more oil. Um, so there's a, there's a huge opposition to that. I don't know if there is here. I'm assuming there probably is. Yeah, but for science fiction fans, it must be amazing because they're seeing all the stuff that can to come true. I think science fiction fans are usually really bright. Yeah. yeah. There is a Star Wars episode, Oh. Yeah. It's on America. Ah. I'd love to find it. Yeah. Okay, we've probably got time for one more question. Hi. Oh, there you go, Steve. I was just wondering if you remained good friends with Krista Reeve until he sadly passed away. We had a very, we didn't have a romantic relationship at all. In fact, when I kissed him, I had to pretend he was Harrison Ford. <laughs> but I did have a romantic relationship with him. Um, uh, because I, we just didn't have that spark. But if you look carefully, we kind of look like brother and sister. And we had a very sibling relationship. And film is so magical that what it records is energy going between two people. So we had an intimacy that read in the film as romantic. In real life, we were like brother and sister and bickered and all that sort of thing. And we were friends, not close, close, close friends. I was more friends with his friend Robin Williams than I was with Chris. I loved Robin. So my dog is named Jack Robin, uh, who I got the week Robin died. Um, and it was a huge loss. Christopher had an amazing transformation after his accident. When his accident first happened, I thought of all the people to have this happen to, there couldn't be a worse candidate than Chris. He's never gone inside himself to do any internal, what I call internal exploration. He's, he's, he's not figured out really who he is or where, what his place in the world was. He was very all about the external. After that accident, he really did go inside and really did bloom remarkably as a human being in terms of compassion, desire to help others, uh, everything I hold dear, generosity of spirit. And I remember seeing him at one point, gosh, a few years after the accident, and I said, Chris, don't take this the wrong way, but you're in better shape now than you were before. And luckily, he really understood what I meant, and he went, I know. Because um, had he not done that explanation, he wouldn't have got what I meant. And he did one of them, and, that, and he became extraordinary at the accident. Really, really an extraordinary person. And before, he was like a young man who hadn't done all of his life homework. I don't know how else to put it. Does that, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But yeah. Okay, thanks, Margot. Ladies and gentlemen, Margot Pinner.